Chapter 10 is all about the immunity in the mucosal tissues. So we call it mucosal immunity, but it's going to be covering all of the, um, the differences that we see in tissues that are associated with the mucosal surfaces. So um, really we are going to be, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of differences in the specifics. So like, you know, our, P, our T cells and our B cells have developed and matured. They've gone through their selective processes. Um, activation can look a little bit different, but overall, generally the, the system is all the same. The immune response is going to be what's different. And, and previously we looked at both innate and adaptive immunity. And we talked about how, um, or the example that we often used was like a bacterial pathogen gets in through a break in the skin. And it's a really easy way to talk about antigen, you know, processing, presenting, and, and how the immune response can develop. But in real world scenarios, only a fraction of pathogens that the human body encounters would be through um, a break in the skin and bacteria getting in. Actually, almost, you know, almost nearly all of the types of pathogens your body comes into contact is through mucosal surfaces. Um, uh, viruses are by far and away way more common pathogens than bacteria are to humans. And viruses get in through mucosal surfaces. So largely the respiratory tract uh, and gastrointestinal tract. So let's just review. This has been a long time since we talked about mucosae and the mucosal tissues throughout the body. Um, so mucosal surfaces, mucosae, uh, mucosa, if you're talking about multiple tissues, they're going to be found throughout the body, um, except for in the extremities. So not in the limbs. Um, but they're going to be, you know, pretty much internal, pretty much out of sight. They're not exposed to the, the environment mostly. Um, and they have a characteristic mucus. That's where the, the term kind of comes from, is the, this layer of thick, viscous fluid that coats these surfaces, these mucosal surfaces. And this mucus, or this liquid is called a mucus. Mucus contains glycoproteins, proteoglycans, peptides, a variety of enzymes um, are... Uh, antimicrobial peptides, those kinds of things that um, are all included in this mucus. And collectively, yes, they keep moisture in, but they also do a really good job of protecting the mucosal surfaces from damage and from exposure to pathogens. Now, mucosal epithelial uh, tissues then are particularly vulnerable when pathogens are able to breach not only get through the mucus, but also then breach that epithelial layer and get down into the tissues. We have openings all over the body, right? Especially in the head area, lots of different openings through the nose, the ears, the mouth, eyes, right? And, and pathogens try to get into the body through those easy accessible openings. So here's a diagram. Again, I think we looked at this one. This probably is from chapter two or three or maybe even one, um, but it's the where the mucosal tissues are located. And so you have um, more external, like the um, gastrointestinal tract, right? So you have the oral cavity um, and the respiratory tract, um, nasal cavity um, that then goes down into the lungs or down into the stomach and then the, the gut. But then there's internal tissues. And so like the glands, salivary gland, um, lacrimal gland, that'll make the tears, mammary gland, that'll make the breast milk. Um, and then kidneys and the urogenital tract also is included in the mucosal surfaces because they also have this, um, this mucus that maybe not up into the kidney itself, but definitely through the tubules and down into the bladder. So these mucosal surfaces are very large. And in fact, if you were to spread it all out and measure it all out, mucosal surfaces in an adult are actually larger than the skin surface area. So, you know, if you look at the small intestine, for example, there's a lot of surface area um, packed into a small area. 
And so defending these tissues um, is really uh, done through coating it in that mucus, but then that mucus is also going to contain IgA. So antibody that is predominantly found in mucosal services is secretory IgA um, in its dimeric form. And it does a fantastic job at neutralization. We looked in chapter nine at antibody function and we saw that IgA, one of its major roles is to neutralize. And by neutralizing, it will grab onto viruses or grab onto bacteria and prevent them from interacting with the epithelial layer. They also, um, <clears throat> there's also other antibodies in there. So IgG can be found slightly, IgM can be found in small amounts. And um, sometimes these other antibodies can also lead to opsonization. And so they'll coat the antibody and then um, macrophages can, can pick it up and destroy it. But neutralization is a major uh, response or a major protective thing that the immune system does. IgG, um, yes, can be found, but it's majorly, um, the majority of that is found up into the uh, respiratory tract and the urogenital tract. Um, IgE is present as well, lots of times in the respiratory tract, um, can be in the gut and the saliva, but definitely IgA is going to be the dominant antibody in those mucosal um, secretions. So a distinctive feature then of the gut mucosa is that it is in constant contact with tons and tons of microorganisms. We've talked about the microbiota. We've, we've discussed the importance of having microbiota. And if you, you know, read anything online or watch any you know, shows on TV, you're going to have people talk about how important the microbiome is. You can't walk an aisle without seeing some sort of, in a store without seeing some sort of probiotic or prebiotic or things like that out there to promote a healthy microbiome. And we need these organisms, but also we need to keep them out of places they're not supposed to be. And so the mucosal surfaces are constantly sampling, especially with the gut. If we, we look at the gut, because that definitely by far and away has the most mm, amount of microbiota present. And there's gonna be continually sampling of these microbes that are residing in the gut. And this can lead to an activation of B cells, which can produce IgM and IgA, just like what we saw with um, the immune response. So T cells will help B cells make specific antibody against gut microbiota. But the difference is that it's going to be a much more anti-inflammatory environment, more humoral rather than cell-mediated. We'll look at that in our, our second part of this lecture. A transcytosis is a process we um, introduced earlier in the semester, but it is the process where uh, antibodies are made on the um, tissue side of the epithelial layer and then they are put into uh, little vesicles and transported to the lumen of the gut. And so that process of making antibody on one side of the epithelial layer and moving it to the other side to be able to interact with the gut microbes is called transcytosis. Now, a major challenge then that the body has is to make immune responses that eliminate the pathogenic microorganisms and, you know, maintain the growth of commensal organisms, but can't interfere with the gut's ability to absorb um, the nutrients that the body needs. So it's a delicate balance, and that's why we see so many issues with people having an imbalance in their gut. Um, and we see, you know, a lot of IBS and we see, um, you know, a lot of uh, malabsorption when you have, you know, any sort of imbalance. And so a good microbiome is very, very important for, for overall health.
Um, in every mucosal surface or every tissue layer, epithelial layer of mucosal tissues, um, we've, we've talked about how there's tight junctions, whether it's columnar epithelial cells or cuboidal epithelial cells, there's these tight junctions. And they're going to prevent um, things from passing from the internal environment of the body to the external environment of the lumen. Uh, and we have mucus that coats this and helps prevent any of that movement from one side to the other. And um, here's a, a picture, a diagram of what those mucin glycoprotein molecules look like. So just looking at the structure, you can see that it's very, there's a lot of chains and there's a lot of bends in these chains and pieces coming off and multiple chains. And you can imagine if you have a bunch of these all over the place, they're gonna get tangled together. And that's where that viscosity comes from. And so these are proteinaceous um, sugar molecules. So they're sticky because of the, the sugars. Um, they're linked together through the proteins and they just make this viscous, you know what mucus looks like, you've seen it, everybody's uh, seen mucus at some point. And you can see now by the structure of those mucinin proteins that, uh, or glycoproteins, that you can, you can kind of understand why that viscosity is there. So anyway, this is just an image to show, show you that. And they really prevent a lot of pathogens then from making their way through that epithelial layer down into the, the tissue of the body. So these intertwining um, gigantic proteins prevent and kind of trap bacteria, viruses, and they're not able to actually ever gain access to that epithelial layer, at least that's the majority of them. Um, then attached in these um, mucus proteins are antibodies. So you can see a little bit of IgA, see how it's being made on the basal side, and then transcytosis, um, transcytosed through the epithelial layer out to the lumen of the gut. And then IgM is also done in the same way. Now the gut epithelial layer um, interacts a lot with, you know, pathogens, with microbiota, there's constant movement of the gut tissue, peristalsis, we have movement of the mucus moving across, we have food sliding across and everything else. And so the epithelial layer turns over very rapidly. And so what every two days or so, there's a brand new epithelial layer there. And all of that mucus and those microbiota, those uh, bacteria, they're all gonna be moved out as well. And so we have a constant turnover, a renewal of cells. Okay, I want to take the last few slides in this lecture and look at specific um, sections of the mucosal layers and talk about them uh, both anatomically, but then um, we can bring in some other components um, related to the specifics with immunity. So the GI tract starts at the mouth, ends at the anus. It's a tube within a tube, right? That's what that body is. And so things will come in through the mouth and then travel on through this long journey um, and then eventually be eliminated through the um, colon um, and the anus. So segments of this gastrointestinal tract are very different based on what um, location we're at and what the job is for that particular section of the tract. And so there's going to be different proteins, there's going to be different pHs. Um, and as food travels along this GI tract, it's going to become more and more and more degraded. First, the mouth is going to start chewing it up into smaller pieces. Then it will get into the stomach or churning and acidity will break it up into further smaller pieces. And then as it starts to pass through the small intestine and the large intestine, um, nutrients are removed, but 
microbiota are helping with that. And so there's constant interaction then with these foods with bacteria. And then as you get further and further down the um, large intestine and into the colon, there's less and less food particles and more and more and more bacteria. So commensal organisms, um, super important. We looked at that early on in the semester. We need them because they provide um, nutrients or they provide enzymes to help break down food and so we can extract more nutrients out of it. And so we've co-evolved along with our microbiome and we have a symbiotic relationship with them. It's actually mutualistic, but we call them commensal organisms. So we have our bacteria that can synthesize um, metabolites that we can't. And so we can then utilize, for example, vitamin K. We're not able to make it ourselves. We need to have bacteria to help us do that. Um, they can break down plant fibers. We don't make the enzymes to break down cellulose, but some bacteria that we have can help break that down and we can get nutrients out of that. Um, some foods we eat can have proteins in that are toxic to us, but our bacteria that live among us, in us, can help break down those toxins so that they're not toxic to us in their broken down form. And just taking up space, that's a big one too. When you have um, a lot of bacteria living in the gut, there's not going to be a lot of extra room for pathogenic bacteria or opportunistic pathogens to come in. And then they can interact with the epithelium um, to trigger secondary lymphoid tissue um, response. And so then we can have dendritic cells showing and we have our galt and our malt. Oh, in this case, we're talking about, yeah, I guess both. Galt is a type of malt, our gut associated lymphoid tissue, where we do have show. Um, um, T cells, path or um, sorry, <laughs> a, a notification just popped up here, um, and I think I lost my internet. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, dendritic cells can process and present antigen to T cells, activating them. You know the the process that we've already looked at, and that happens in that gulch or that malt. So most bacterial infections then the gut are caused by our commensal organisms. We have salmonella and shigella and helicobacter and e system keeps them in check. And because of that, uh, we don't pathogenic variants of these species or of these gen um, genera and we can end up getting infections um, if they're given the opportunity and we have that pathogenic strain. Now, viruses are also another major cause of gastrointestinal um, issues. And in fact, um, viruses are, are more often the cause of um, acute GI issues um, outside of physiological issues um, caused by the tissues itself, like IBS or different things like that. Infections of the uh, epithelial lining of the small intestine, um, yeah, norovirus, rotavirus, major causes. Norovirus is the number one cause of um, gastrointestinal stress from a pathogen. And um, we also can have parasites. So a lot of single cell parasites like cryptosporidium, um, giardia lamblia, they will reside in the gut as well as do worms. And so a lot of um, multicellular parasites and single cellular parasites can live in the gut and, and cause issues there as well. So during early childhood, then the human body um, and the immune system, which is learning and training and growing and developing, and they're all going to, the body is going to be maturing and developing in the presence of microbiota. And so a, a, you have your microbiota early from the start of life and you continue to grow along with it throughout life. 
And um, I think an important thing to point out at this point is the immune system can only get better and stronger if it um, is tested, if it is trained, if it is worked out. It's just like, you know, um, athletes, they're never going to get better if they don't practice and, and work out, right? That's the same with the immune system. If it's not used regularly, then it's just this um, through studies done with germ-free organisms. So that means that mice are growing in a completely sterile environment and they're never exposed to any pathogen. And immune system. Acted, you know, expose the body so that it is able to develop a fully functional immune system. Okay, the GALT. Um, this is the um, lymphoid tissue associated with the gut or with the GI tract. And the gut and, and other mucosal surfaces. And there's really two distinct compartments when we talk about the GALT. It's a secondary lymphoid tissue and there's an inductive compartment and there's an effector compartment. Now the inductive department or department compartment uh, is right below the mucosal epithelium. And this is where there's going to be interactions with the antigen, the dendritic cells and lymphocytes. And this will then develop or induce an immune response. Now the effector compartment is the underlying connective tissue, lamina propria, um, and this is going to include the effector cells. So those that have already proliferated and differentiated into their effector role. So um, the effector T cells, uh, macrophages, mast cells, eosinophils, they all just kind of live there and they hang out and uh, they're ready and waiting if they ever need to be called up. Now the GALT will continually monitor and um, sample the organisms in the gut lumen. They'll sneak out, grab some, bring it in, test it, and allow immune responses to be initiated or induced and before like a full blown immune response has to be initiated. And then also it can help um, prevent the um, replication of the pathogen, which can lead to destruction of epithelial lining, which then leads to bleeding and fluid loss, which we see as bloody diarrhea. So it all starts in the mouth. Um, we have tonsils in the back of the mouth. Um, they guard the entrance down into the body. These include the palatine tonsils, the adenoids, as well as the lingual tonsils. Now in early childhood, when a child or a baby is being exposed to um, the environment for the first times, the mouth really is where everything goes, right? You've all probably seen a baby or, a, you know, like a six month old or maybe a little bit um, older. Everything goes in the mouth. They're learning through the mouth and they're picking up all kinds of microorganisms along the way. And so tonsils are, are pretty great at, you know, being that gatekeeper, but they can become inflamed and um, have reoccurrent um, uh, infections and they can become swollen and sometimes they can be removed. This isn't done as much as anymore as it used to be, um, but it is still, still can be done. They, the pro is really not a huge deal if they get taken out um, in the end for, for a patient or for a child, they can still have a a fully developed immune system. It's just, uh, they'll have maybe a little bit less IgA being produced because IgA is uh, one of those 
mucosal associated um, uh, ways that the immune system responds. So the one of the most common antibodies uh, and is produced, you know, in, in the tonsils. So if they're taken out, not going to have as much. Now, when we get a little bit further down into the GI tract, we enter the small intestine. Stomach is super acidic. Not a lot is there because of the high acidity. And so we're just going to go right into the small intestine. Now, characteristics of the secondary lymphoid organs in the small intestine, or the, the characteristic ones, are called Peyer's patches. Peyer's patches are scattered throughout the small intestine, and they actually form like little domes of B and T cell areas. And at the tip of those domes, there's going to be a cell called an M cell. An M cell allows for passage between the lumen down into the tissue of the gut or of the body. Um, there's about five to 200 B cell uh, follicles with germinal centers. So really big antibody producing um, areas. And um, <clears throat> there's going to be T cells there because B cells can't do anything without the help of T cells. And, and there could be some dendritic cells there as well to help you know, B cells and T cells find each other and all of that stuff that we discussed previously. There's also a lot of um, isolated lymphoid follicles where just B cells are going to be and plasma cells. And um, they're going to be secreting IgA so that that can be moved across into the epithelial layer. So a lot goes on absorption, of course, for the body in the small intestine, but a lot of immunity goes on in the small intestine as well through those Peyer's patches and those lymphoid follicles. As we um, <clears throat> get a little bit further down into the um, GI tract, I just want to mention the appendix. The appendix is often thought of as like a vestigial feature that's left over from some ancestor that we had and now it really doesn't have much of a function. Well, the appendix is kind of part of, it's attached to the large intestine and it's packed with lymphoid follicles. So we call it a secondary lymphoid tissue because of its, it's almost like tonsils down on the large intestine. Um, but just like the tonsils becoming inflamed, the appendix can become um, super inflamed as well with infection and needs to be removed. There's really no known um, effect when somebody has their appendix removed, but if it does get inflamed, it needs to be removed because if it bursts, it can release a lot of um, immune complexes. It can release a lot of enzymes into the tissue, which can, can be rather destructive. 